morning. <laughs> Krinda is here with us this morning, and she is going to be giving us our morning announcements. If you want to open your bulletin up, she's only got like a few dozen things to run over with you. Welcome. Uh, so, first thing is kids' ministry. Yay. Woohoo! <laughs> Uh, parents of infants to children two years old are welcome to use our nursery. It's awesome, by the way, so I highly recommend you use it. Uh, children who are three years old to fifth grade can take part in children's church today. Um, if you notice on our bulletin, it's right after our hymn from lovely David uh, from All That Dwell Below the Sky. So the kids can just head out this door and they can head down to the gym and there'll be an adult down there that will supervise them and they can get all their energy out and you'll think... You'll thank those people later today. Um, uh, the band festival, there's like a thousand band kids and they like food. Um, so on the 9th and the 16th, if you are willing to volunteer to make some delicious cookies, uh, teenagers love any kind of sweets. Actually, they just love food in general. So um, even if you're not the best cook, they'll probably love it anyway. <laughs> Um, and then pastor's coffee, if you're new to the church um, and you want to get to know more about our church and our pastor and anything like that, you can sign up in the back um, and that'll be held next week. Is that right? And so uh, sign up back there um, and get to know our awesome church. Um, the first UMC cookbooks um, are available. Uh, women's luncheon is after church today. So if you're a woman and you like food, um, then you might want to head downstairs because you can get some food there. Um, so all women, uh, First United Methodist women are invited to attend that. Oh, it's in the gym. Don't go downstairs. Then you have to go back upstairs. So, so uh, it's in the commons area. So if you go downstairs, you just have to get a little more exercise and more steps. Um, and then the last thing is pie sales. Last but not least, pie sales. We all love the pies. Um, they're only going to make 500 this year. So, no, we're not going to just make 500. Oh, it's up in the air. <laughs> Barbara's jumping ahead on the pies, it sounds like. So if you like pies and you want pies, sounds like you better volunteer. <laughs> so so uh, that, I, that, I believe, is all the announcements for today.
Would y'all stand, please? For the call of worship. <clears throat> I will praise you, Lord, although you were angry with me. Your anger has turned away, and you have com comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. From all that dwell below the skies. The children may now come and head to the doors. So kids going to kids' church, we got we got a little music for you. So you can kind of groove. You want to groove? Can I embarrass you some more? Uh, supposed to announce uh, the wedding celebration of Stan and Sandy Moore tonight. Tonight, 1 to 5 p.m. of the 18th. On September 18th. Is that Saturday? Next Saturday, 1 to 5? And the whole church is invited, welcome to come. They normally sit over there, but now I don't see them. It's late announcement, late announcement. Uh, yesterday was a big day for our nation as we remember 20 years ago, the devastation that happened in New York and, and in other places as well. Um, and so many of us kind of paused. If you turned on the TV, you couldn't help but to see that there were tributes being, being paid. Uh, it was very interesting to watch as there were children who participated who weren't even alive when it had occurred that were grandchildren and, and things like that. It was incredibly touching. So what I would like us to do is as we begin our time of prayer, if we can bow our heads and if we can have a moment of silence, and we can remember those individuals who, who paid the ultimate price and honor them with this time of silence. Lord, 20 years later, it's still heartbreaking. It is still heartbreaking to see the images, the videos, to hear the family share like it was something that just happened yesterday. 
and yet it does feel like it just happened yesterday. And so, Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for those families that were grieving yesterday, that had to kind of live through the scenario one more time, that had to tell the story one more time. And we pray for them. Lord, we pray that they're able to rest this morning, that as many of them uh, had to step into the anxiety and the sadness of yesterday, that today, perhaps they woke up a little more hopeful, a little more hopeful in our, in our nation, a little more hopeful about their lives and about the process of grief and the time that it takes, that they would be hopeful about many things. And Lord, in what we hope for them, I hope the same thing for us. That, that we have tragedies, that we experience losses, that we experience hurts. And that every day, perhaps we have an opportunity to tell once again the story of what happened and the hurt that, that created and, and the, the emotional rippling wave that moves through our lives and the lives of those we love. Lord, you are the great comforter. You are the great counselor. And that is why we come to this place to experience the hopefulness that you place in us as your people. Holy Spirit, come into this place and do a powerful work in us that we would be the people of hope and that this would be the house of hope and that our community would know that this is where hope resides. And so we pray for your strength in this another day. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your teachings and for your help in this as well and your scriptures and your passages that lead us into greater hopefulness. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we are about to take up our, our offering now. And one of the reasons that we give is because the church is a place of hope. And so we give to the church for many reasons. We give to the church because it's what God asks us to do. Uh, we give to the church because we celebrate the work that's done in the community and in our own lives. We, we give because we are, in essence, giving to our community. Uh, but we also give because the church stands as a beacon of hope. And financially, we support that hope message that goes out into all the world. And so I would invite the ushers to come forward in order to collect our offering this morning, an offering of hope. And if we can pray, Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the hope message. Um, Lord, it is, it is a hope offering that we place today and that we give today. And we want to see our, our financial gifts go towards a transforming message of hope within our church, within our community, and within the world. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
The scripture day is from 2 Samuel, chapter 23, verse 8 through 17. <clears throat> These are the names of David's mighty warriors. Joseph Bathshebeth, a Tecamonite, was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 800 men who he killed in one encounter. Next to him was Eleazar, son of Dode the Aohite. As one of the three mighty warriors, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines, gathered there for battle. Then the Israelites retreated, but Eleazar stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eleazar, but only to strip the dead. Next to him was Shema, the son of Agi the Herite. When the Philistines banded together at the place where there was a full field of lentils, Israel's troops fled from them. But Shema took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory. During harvest time, three of the 30 chief warriors came down to David at the cave, at, cave of Adullam, while a band of Philistines was encamped at the Valley of Rephaim. At that time, David was in the stronghold and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and said, oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three mighty warriors broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. Far be it from me, Lord, to do this, he said. Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives? And David would not drink it. Such were the exploits of the three mighty warriors. This week, uh, <clears throat> Terry, Terry, who read her scripture, she had come into the office. She said, okay, I'm reading scripture this week, you know, and tell, me, tell me what I'm reading. And I looked at Terry and I go, oh, Terry, I'm so sorry. 
I'm so sorry. Like, this week I've got every Hebrew name in my sermon that you have never wanted to try to pronounce in your life. And I said, just remember, Terry, nobody else out there knows. I don't even know. She did a great job. She did an awesome job. And I, yeah. I, th- I threw all kinds of curveballs at her. She did, she did great. So last week's sermon uh, is basically the opposite of this week's sermon. It's, it's uh, preach opposite sermon month, and so that's kind of what I've done. Last week, I talked about being a guardian of your soul and how to be the guardian of your soul and the importance of being a guardian over your soul. And I talked a little bit about burnout in the church and how burnout can occur and Maybe some of you have experienced that. Maybe some of you know some people that aren't here with us today because they experienced a burnout of their soul. Sometimes when we do too much, too fast, uh, we can kind of exhaust ourselves. And you have to prioritize, what I said was you've got to prioritize soul work in order to do better kingdom work. And you've got to be careful to not let those things get out of place. Soul work comes first. And then kingdom work comes next. It's like the fuel to do kingdom work. So somebody last week needed to hear that message. And they heard that message and it was good. Just like somebody this week needs to hear this kind of opposite message. This different message uh, that I'm going to talk about when you've done your soul work. And when you've made that investment. And different seasons of life call for different decisions about how we prioritize our time. Just kind of how it is. So this morning I want to talk to you about being a champion of the faith. A champion of the faith. And as your pastor, my context <clears throat> for raising up champions is First United Methodist Church. It's a church you're a part of. But the teaching points, I think, go way beyond First United Methodist Church. It's going to go way beyond your connection to this church is going to go into other areas of your life where you are where you are involved because the truth is we need champions of the faith in our church but we also need them in our community we need them in our families we need them in our workplaces and we need them in our schools we need faith champions everywhere so feel free to translate what i'm saying in all areas of your life because it it simply can be translated And the man who will be doing the teaching today about becoming a champion of the faith is none other than King David. King David. David was the greatest king who ever ruled over all of Israel. And David was great. David was great. But don't get lost in all the stories about his individuality. All the stories about just him and and what he did. Because in 2 Samuel 23, what Terry so eloquently read to us today, we see the story behind the story of the greatest king that Israel ever had, right? And the whole story is what made David great were all the men that surrounded him and all the men that he chose to put in leadership in his life. A group of mighty warriors actually mentioned very little throughout the scriptural story. Very little in in 2 Samuel, right? But we get to the end and suddenly we get the full story that there were always these mighty men behind him, right? Right? Uh, And these mighty men and David will show us all today three areas of growth and development that we need to make within ourselves if we are going to be faith champions in our church, our community, our workplaces, and our schools. Three ways to be a better change agent by your faith and because of your faith. So, very first lesson. Very first thing, the thing that's of greatest necessity, especially to David when he was, when he was looking for these, these men. Uh, number one for mighty, the, David's mighty warrior list is courage. You've got to be a person of courage. It takes courage to be a champion of the faith. And as a child, 
David watched over his father's sheep. And as he watched over his father's sheep, he killed both the lion and the bear in defense of those sheep as a boy. He grows up as a teen, as a young man. David fought against the great champion Goliath, right? The great champion Goliath and killed Goliath in battle with a slingshot (laughs) and a rock uh, against a sword and great armor and a spear. And so David had this courage. And because of his courage, he inspired confidence in all the people who followed him, in all of his mighty men, in all people. And David chose men to surround him who were equal in tenacity. They had a similar tenacity as he did. Friends, if you are going to be a champion for the faith, then at some point it is very likely that you will need to stand up and lead. You will have to stand up and lead. And friends, courage and faith will equip you. They're the armor that that we will put on. It's the sword that we will hold. Courage and faith will equip you for the job. And let me tell you, because I, I know a thing or two about this, Courage is not the absence of fear, right? Courage is pushing forward while experiencing the full effects of fear. And I got news for you. Like you read about David from beginning to end, some of David's courage when he was a youth was his youthful enthusiasm. Do you remember youthful enthusiasm? Right? Like when you thought you could just do everything and anything and there, there wouldn't be any repercussions. And then as you got older, some of that youthful enthusiasm kind of wears off because we realize that there are repercussions for our actions. And sometimes those repercussions go, go far further than us. And I got news for you. I think courage gets harder with age. It's harder with age. We need courage more and more as we age because we become more and more aware. We have felt the effects of those things before, but but we still need it. Uh, Jeff Baker. Jeff Baker works for the United Methodist Conference Office of Missouri. He's a very close friend of mine. He's, He's been a good friend of mine for eight years. He lives in Columbia and works at the conference office. Uh, Jeff made the difficult decision midlife after being a police officer and after being a construction person um, that he was going to go work for the Office of Creative Ministries there in Columbia that did missions, social justice, disaster relief, did a lot of those things. Jeff ended up following a gentleman whose name was, was Max Marble and Max Marble had been in that role for I think 15 to 17 years. You've, you might have heard his, his name before. And Jeff, when he became director over that ministry of of missions and service and justice, he developed a relationship between Missouri Methodism and the country of Haiti. The country of Haiti. And Haiti had a issue that continues to be an issue, and that is clean water. And because they didn't drink clean water, many, many people, many families would get sick, and some even die because of that. And so we were bringing clean water filters to Haiti, and it was, it was a project of his that, that went over really well. Friends, is anybody, who's, who's been to Haiti? We got some people who have been to Haiti? Okay, all right, we got a handful. I've, I've been to Haiti. I went on a, a, a mission trip to, to Haiti with Jeff. Friends, um, parts of Haiti, like lots of Haiti, a little bit sketchy, a little bit unsafe, especially if you're, you know, white-skinned and, and American, you're kind of sticking out like a, a sore thumb there. It can be unsafe. We stayed in a hotel. When I, when I went on my mission trip with Jeff, we stayed in a hotel that was basically like a compound in, in the middle of, of the city we were in. And it had, a, it had a perimeter fence made out of cement block, about, about this thick, went all the way around, was like 10 feet tall and there was an iron gate that was electric and it would slide open and close for us as we would come in and there was a armed guard I don't know if he was trained or not but there was an armed guard with a shotgun 
that stood behind that gate and they, they rotated, but 24-7, there was a man with a shotgun behind the gate. Friends, the only thing that comforted me more than the blocks and the iron gate and the man with the shotgun was my friend Jeff's courage, and he just stayed calm, and he planned things really well. And because of Jeff's courage, in what he was doing, I had confidence that we were, going to be, we were going to be fine because he was the leader, because he stepped up to do that. He made that decision. Friends, if you're going to be a champion for your faith, then at some point, you will need to step out. And you will need to step out and lead in courage. And I'm here to tell you that there are often times where, where God gives us enough courage to make the step. And we look at the rest and say, oh, Lord, I don't know how. I don't know how. And the Lord says, today you have enough courage to take this step. And tomorrow, I'll give you enough courage to take that step. And so we, we develop more courage along the way when we say yes to be God's champion. After courage, after courage, the next lesson we learn from David about being a faith champion is that you, you have to organize your team. You've got to organize your team because other people are want, want to be involved in things. Friends, champions are not lone rangers. Now, we've got to be careful because sometimes this can happen, but we're not, right? Champions are meant to lead other people who are growing in their courage to be faithful to God in ministry and mission in the church, in the community, in the world. And David was not just strong and courageous, right? He wasn't just that. He was also smart and strategic. Smart and strategic. And I think 2 Samuel 23 is actually like a small glimpse into a much larger strategy that David had for ruling his army. You see, David, David had, had three, right? And so David was king, and he had this small group of warriors along with him, brilliantly named the Three. <laughs> that's, that's what he called him, right? He called him the Three. And so the Three worked together, uh, and so they had a sense of equality, and yet one stood out as commander above the rest. And I'm not even going to try to pronounce the names. But he had one who was commander above all, and then three that worked together over all the armies. Now, what's interesting is not only did we have the three, but we also had the 30. Once again, brilliantly named, especially for something I'll show you here a little bit later. And so, and I don't know if it was stacked this way or not, but there were the 30 underneath the three, underneath the one. And so once again, there is this sense of unity with the three working together, and yet one is above in leadership, and there is still this sense of unity that the three are a part of the 30, and yet the three give direction to the 30, right? And so he created this plan of unity, and yet authority. Friends, if you're going to be a champion of the faith here at First United Methodist Church, You've got to find a way to organize your team. If your message is important, if your mission is important, if your ministry is important, you've got to organize your team, and your ability to organize your team will actually likely be the determining factor for your effectiveness in doing what it is you want to do. Um, will you do what's needed to get everybody on the same page or not? And if you, if you don't have the organizational skills, if you sit here and you're like, Pastor Jim, I'm excited about whatever this is. I just, I don't know how to, how to make all this thing happen. Well, then I would suggest to you that it's very, this right here is very important. Who's your number two? Who's your number two that maybe has some of those gifts, those organizational gifts that you don't have? This, this teamwork, teamwork makes the dream work, right? Uh, today... Today we're launching Kids Church, we're launching the nursery. 
for the first time in a year and a half. I'm here to tell you, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a long road. It's going to be a long road to recovery because when you don't do something for a year and a half, when a lot of churches around you have been, and we, we did the right thing, but it's going to be it's going to be a road. And so I'm thankful that we had a handful of people that said, yeah, I want to volunteer for this. I want to help kids ministry get going. I believe it's important. And we've been missing this from our church. But for me, there was really only one question I had to answer before hitting the go button, right? Because I said, here's our date. I asked for volunteers. I was a little reluctant to put it back out there that here's, here's when we're starting. But until I did... And I did it when I did it because I had one question I had to ask, and that one question was, do I have a kids ministry champion? Do I have a champion? Do I have a volunteer who will take ownership over this ministry or not? And so a couple weeks ago, I met with with Don Curl, who is a, a member here, and she proved to be that champion for me. And Pastor Marsha was, was a part of that meeting, and she's providing Don support. Um, and she's going to help. She's going to be a part of this team that helps develop this team, that helps work with volunteers. And friends, that is in line with my, my staffing philosophy on why a church should hire staff, right? We staff are here to provide leadership and support as we do ministry alongside the laity who are faith champions. The lay leaders who are faith champions. We are here to help you organize your team, our team, right? David had one leader who was a part of three, who was a part of 30. Folks, if I don't have a champion in the church who is willing to help organize a team for a ministry or a mission or whatever it is, it tells me when I don't have that person that the church doesn't actually care about the ministry area. And my philosophy, which I, I don't 100%, but I somewhat do, if, if you don't care, then I don't care. Don't expect me to have some enthusiasm about something that you actually don't have any enthusiasm about enough to lead within our church. I have pastor friends in churches, and they get in there, and, and, and right now and in other times, like, some real key ministries struggle because there's not point leadership, because nobody will do it. And I've got pastor friends, and what they'll do is they'll step into that key role, and they'll take over, and they'll take charge, and they'll just kind of hope that somebody else will eventually come along and, and will help with something. And I need you all to know up front, that's not how I roll, Right? That, that's not generally how I tend to do things. And actually, if you ever, like, if you're ever like, you know, pastor, like, I think we need this staff, I, I, we need the staff position. Our church really benefit from this staff position. Here's, here's how you don't want to pitch it to me. And don't ever pitch it to me with, pastor, we really can't find anyone to do this. Nobody really wants to do this here. And so I think we should hire somebody to do it, since nobody wants to do it. Friends, that's, that's not what we hire staff for. We hire staff to support your vision and your hope and your dream and your, and your love and to come alongside you and to work with you on that, to see you step into leadership as we step into leadership with you. Champions organize the team and they work together with the team because they care about the team. And they care about the cause. And they care about the people. And so they just have to. They have to step into it. They have to do it. That's what I want to see. I want to see how much you care. The last thing we learned from David and his, and his mighty men, right? We, we got to have courage. Um, you got to organize your team. But the last thing that the mighty men teach is about being a faith champion is looking for and developing potential in others around them. They're always looking for and developing potential in, in others around them. Even before David was king, he was, he was looking for courage in warriors. He was looking for court courage, right? And he was developing friendships, and he was developing alliances with all these, these different men. And when he became king... 
he appointed three. Like he appointed three to be a part of his, his military, to lead his military. And they, they continued, after they had the three, right, they continued to look for capable warriors to help train and, and to help lead the ranks. And the rest of Samuel 23, we just read half of it, but the rest of Samuel 23, the author goes on to list all of the brave men who were a part of the 30. List them all by name and some, some of what they did. Guess how many men are listed as a part of the 30. Wrong! <laughs> you would think that, right? It's, it's uh, 37. 37. Uh, either somebody couldn't count, basic math wasn't taught in school for early Israelites, I, I don't know. Was, but it, the, the last passage actually says 37 in all. 37 in all. Now, I don't know this to be the case. I don't know this, but I would imagine that uh, the number started smaller, like we started with 10, and then we kind of have 15. And then I would think at, at one point somebody kind of thought, you know what, 30 sounds like a good stopping place. Let's, we're we're going to be 30 mighty men, right? That's, that's going to be our group. And everybody kind of agreed, yeah, 30, whoosh, we're done. But then they had the 30, and some young man showed potential. And they were like, eh, I know he said 30. Let's make it 31, right? And they, and they did that over and over and over again as they saw these young men coming up through the ranks that had potential and they wanted them to lead. So 30 became eventually 37. Now, <clears throat> it could also be that as these men died in battle, that they, that they added. I feel like my first argument supports my sermon more. So I'm going to stick with the initial, the initial kind of thought on this. Uh, a champion of the faith knows what it takes to lead and to help future generations <clears throat> develop their ability and help them do the same. Helps future generations. And friends, in the church, I, I will give you, I will give you some of this happens through osmosis. Like some of it just happens. You go to church and you kind of learn to lead some, and you go to Sunday school, and you learn to lead some, and you sit in maybe some of our different committee meetings, and eh, eh, you know, maybe you learn to lead some. But I would argue, I would contend that most of what we learn in leadership doesn't actually happen by osmosis. It doesn't happen just by sitting here. And here's why. Because it's personal. It's personal. And friends, if you're not willing to make it personal, then another church down the street will make it personal. And if you're not willing to make it personal, there's an organization out there that's doing good things, and they'll bring in young leaders, and they'll teach them how to be a part of the team. Or there's some college out there, some university, and some, some alumni will call somebody up and say, hey, we'd love you to be a part of, of this group, and we'll help develop you, and you can help, help us take take care of the university, take care of the alma mater. Friends, churches aren't the only ones looking for champions to provide leadership. We're not the only ones. Champions believe in the importance of the cause enough to make it personal with those who show potential. Champions aren't afraid to sit down with somebody and say, gosh, these are your gifts. Like, I see these things in you. I see you developing in this way, and that's great. Can you tell me about that? Tell me about your gifts. Or they see passion in somebody, some young person. They sit down. Tell me, tell me about this passion. Like, where's this coming from? And how's this coming out? How are you, how are you utilizing kind of this, this passion? I talked to a college student this morning that's, that's back here for the weekend, and she's at a school in Chicago and, and kind of social justice oriented. And so kind of, kind of a great example, like, like tell me about that passion. Where's that come from? I know, I know, I know. We as Methodists, we love our classes and our groups 
and our boards and our processes and our systems, right? Like, we developed all these things. But if we have lost ground somewhere in the last 40 years, I think it's this area. I think it's this area. We have got to be more intentional about developing champions and young champions in the church. And we have to make it personal. We have to make it personal because it is personal. And if you can't make it personal, some other organization, some other church, some other place will. So when it comes to becoming a a champion of the faith, King David and his mighty men have taught us three valuable principles that I want us all to walk away with today. The first one, being a champion takes courage. And courage inspires confidence in people around you when you step out. Second, being a champion means you care enough, you care enough to organize your team. And you care about that team. And last, being a champion means you will help develop future champions by making it personal. Got to make it personal. My hope and prayer is that we can be the kind of church that raises up champions. This is my hope and my prayer for our church and for our community and for the world. And so my closing question to you is, what will your answer be? What will your answer be? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for all the champions that you placed in my life. All those champions that taught me about the importance of of Bible study and prayer and and service and the church and community and and authentic relationship, how to to enter into just real honesty with other people about about our shortcomings and our failures in order to lean harder into the body of Christ and into those relationships. Lord, the church needs so many things. We're we're under-resourced at times. We could could use more staff. We could could use finances to do different things. But Lord, all of that is lost if we don't have champions. Champions. And so, Lord, call them out from amongst our ranks. Call them to lead and to lead courageously and to organize and to help develop the next generation. Call them out, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. We stand and sing immortal, invisible, God only wise. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, thy ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise, unresting. Unhasting and silent as light, no wanting, no wasting, thou rulest in might, thy justice like mountains, thy soaring above, thy clouds which are fountains of goodness and love. Thou reignest in
and we move right into our closing song, Awesome God. standing for a minute if, if Eric Adams and Kathy Huff Eric Adams and Kathy Huff want to come up here I started something about a month ago uh, I I got a medal I got a medal made and it, it's called um, uh, faith champion here we go FUMC leadership champion and what I did was I I saw Kathy and, and Kathy was in one of our teams and and did something <clears throat> that I thought that's it like that's what our leaders need to do. Um, <clears throat> and so what I did was she was kind of our first recipient of this medal. And in a board meeting, I gave it to her and I said, Kathy, here's what I saw you do as a champion, as a leader, that I just, I just want everybody to know. And so then I, I gave it to Kathy and said, now, Kathy, what I want you to do is I want you to pick someone to give the medal to where you kind of see some values they're doing that, that you want to lift up. And she picked... Eric as our next faith champion and, and what were the things again that you saw in Eric that that you wanted to lift up we uh, want to recognize Eric and Angela if you'll please come up to because this is a team effort uh, really appreciated their uh, taking the initiative to do the happening event at our church which was a youth oriented event we recognize it takes a whole team to do it. Yep. And so those of us who are being recognized individually are humble yes. in and recognize that it takes a whole team to get a lot done. There's a whole team standing right over there that got those kids taken care of today, which is amazing. Yes. So Eric, here is the award. Eric and Angela. Yeah, uh, put it on her. have a <laughs> ministry. <laughs> And they also uh, were willing to take some risks to make the happening happen. Thank you yes. for your support. And so the challenge is now for you all to find some other ministry champions within our church <laughs> and to pass that, that award on to them. And it's very important that we let people know when we give them this. These are the values that we see in you that we want to lift up and we appreciate. And what I want you, the co congregation, to know is I got four more of those in a desk in my office. <laughs> And, and they are real. That's, they are the real thing. That's right. And so as you see people that, that live into this ministry champion, let, let me know. And we'll present this to them and, and we'll let them know. And that's, that's how we pass this along. So thank you all for, for coming up and doing that. And the grace and the peace of Jesus Christ be with the rest of my champions this week. Amen. Amen.